welcome to the 2023 EGA Spring Panel. So this is our first ever hybrid spring panel. So I'm just going to ask you to bear with us a little bit if things go wrong or as we try to um, work out how this, how this is going to go ahead. So we've got a really interesting topic today and a very interesting one for us here in UCD. We'll be hearing about the AirSat1 project, which was led by UCD out of the Centre for Space Research. And the satellite was developed in UCD mostly by students from across the College of Engineering and Architecture and the College of Science. And um, we're hoping it will be launched later this year. I'm sure David will go into more details about that. We're going to have three speakers. So we're going to have Dr. David McKeown, who is from the School of Mechanical and Materials Engineering, and he's Engineering Manager of AirSat1. We're going to have Dr. Joseph Thompson, who is over here, I think, who is Chief Engineer of AirSat1 and a postdoctoral research here, researcher here in the School of Mechanical and Materials Engineering. And Dr. Maeve Doyle, um, I think recently PhD in February, so she's as Ms. Maeve Doyle on the, the document on my piece of paper, but she is now uh, Dr. Maeve Doyle, so congratulations, who's the lead software engineer for AirSat1, and she's based in the School of Physics here in UCD. We're going to have our three speakers first, and then we'll stop and we'll have a question and answer session. There is a roving mic, or I think a mic that will be thrown to you, so make sure that you catch it when it gets to you. And we'll also have some questions and answers from online, which I think Tanya is going to be looking at the... Oh, sorry, Jay, someone, someone is looking at the online questions as well. So hope we can get some discussion going as well. So I'm going to hand over to David and let him make a start. So thank you very much, Aoife. Um, so it's, it's, it's really great to be here um, because it's a big project. We've been working on it for um, six years now. And it's, yeah, it's about time we told the story in a, in a good way. Um, like that, we go. So. Yes, I'm Dr. David McKeown, uh, Assistant Professor in the School of Mechanical and Materials Engineering, um, and also the Engineering Manager of AirSight One, so different hats. Um, so, uh, what have we been up to? So just personally, maybe you don't know what happens in space uh, in engineering or here in UCD. Um, these are the projects I've been working on, uh, and some of them with Willie O'Connor, who's here as well, uh, going back to 2011. Uh, so we worked on control systems and dynamics. Dynamics is how things move. I'm trying to describe that and do that mathematically and make models of that. Control systems is about making it move the way we want to. Uh, so we started off in 2011, we're looking at X-ray observatories, big, long, flexible systems, 20 meters long, that you want, want to move around in space and make it look at something that's really interesting. Um, but it's interesting in X-rays. And how do you do that? How do you move it around? without it shaking and vibrating and getting a wobbly picture. Just like a camera that you might have, you've got a wobbly picture if your hands are moving, if your spacecraft is vibrating, you get a wobbly picture in the x-rays. So we were looking about controlling the actuators, the things that move the satellite to get rid of this wobble and the shake. And we moved on to looking at robot arms uh, for uh, the Martian environment, looking at, again, controlling, how do you control the motors on the arm so you can reach out and drill or pick something up Without very accurately, without the thing bending. Uh, after that, we became real uh, rocket scientists. We looked at the future launches preparatory program. Launcher is something that, if you're in the space industry, is a rocket uh, for anybody else. So we're looking about how do you change the engine at the bottom of the rocket? You can move that around. So when you're going up into space, that you go up smoothly. Because again, this rocket wants to vibrate and it has liquid fuel inside it, which is getting coming out of it, and that wants to slosh around, and that wants to put you off your target uh, trajectory. So how do we control that? We looked at that. We're getting to the topic of today's talk. We talked about AirSat one. So we six years ago, um, we started looking at this project. So our friends over in the School of Physics uh, had got interested in our, their science experiments and wanted to build a satellite. Um, and then we got involved in the School of uh, or College of Engineering. So I'm going to talk in detail about that, but we're also doing, well, more things in the future, but it's currently looking at some stuff with lunar dust, so dust on the moon, uh, how that gets into uh, spacesuit materials, uh, how it gets into the joints of robotic arms and how it wears them down. Uh, so we're doing tests with that with a German aerospace company. Um, so there's a lot going on, and there's been a lot going on in physics as well, going back in science missions, going back ESA and NASA. So there's a lot of heritage here in UCD that, um, uh, maybe I'll get rid of that. that maybe you don't know about. Uh, and I talk about this ESA, so this European Space Agency funded project. These are all the countries that are in the European Space Agency. Uh, we give money, our government gives money in, and then there's a geo return. We get that money back and it comes into projects uh, like AirSat and our Irish companies, and they fund the space uh, projects going on here. So lots of Europe, Canada as well. <laughs> um, 
And again, lots of Irish companies, about 90 Irish companies working in, in the space. If you look at the side of this Arian 5 rocket, there's the Irish flag proof that we're definitely part of the European Space Agency and definitely working on very interesting things that you might not know. But generally up to now, it's been parts of satellites or parts of rockets or parts or software like that. We hadn't gone and built something that was completely designed and tested and built and going to be operated uh, here in UPD. Uh, that's our AirSight 1 project. That's a, a render of it. We have some real pictures. It's built and ready to go uh, at the moment. But that's a CubeSat. Um, AirSat 1 is Irish, uh, educational Irish research satellite 1. Uh, so it's, a, it's kind of an acronym. Um, and that's because of some of the goals of this is one, we have three payloads that we're going to talk about. So we're doing science and engineering and technology demonstrations on it. But we're also building up the skills and uh, uh, the, the, the knowledge uh, within the colleges, but also in the students that leave the colleges and go out in, into industry. Uh, so it's been built by staff and students. And in students, it's definitely plural. We've had about 50 students over the last six years come through. So generally at master's level or PhD level. So after you finish your undergrad, they've come and, and started working uh, on the project. So it's hit the lives of, of, of many students uh, and, uh, and for the better, I, I think. Um, how are we working out or what, what's the program that's running it? So it's part of something called ESA Education's Fly Your Satellite Program. So there's a structure around it. So within European Space Agency, there's an education office and they uh, do these programs. So they say, we'll give you, if you build a CubeSat, we'll make sure you try to build it properly as in that we'll give you expert advice back, but we'll also make you follow all the milestones that a normal satellite will follow. And if you don't pass them, you're not launching. But if you do pass them all, we'll provide the launch at the end. So they procure and they give us the space on the rocket, uh, which will bring us up to space. Um, so as part of that program, it's impossible to get a team photo because it's been changing uh, all over time. Um, but here's one of the more recent ones where we generally wore all our hoodies and, and looked quite good. Um, there's me, there's Joe and Maeve, uh, but there's so many members uh, of the team. Uh, so generally from mechanical engineering, generally from physics, um, and some from, we have people from computer science, electronic engineering, uh, maths uh, over the years as well. Uh, so it's a great collaboration across the college. Uh, go to the back, I've said that AirSat is a CubeSat. What is a CubeSat? What's well, this idea that we want to standardize how we build satellites, especially small satellites, especially start off with, with university teams, but it's kind of wider uh, than that now. But if you build them in a standardized way, that'll make it cheaper. It'll mean that they can design the bits on the rockets to release these cheaper because you're not just a bespoke satellite every time that you're putting it up, which makes things longer. I think so. So the idea is that we build it in units. Uh, so AirSat's a two U unit, which means we're two units. Each unit is 10 by 10 centimeters. You can build them up into bigger satellites like three U, six U, 12 U. Um, why do you build a satellite? You don't build it just to put it up there. You want to have uh, some payloads. You want to do some science or some engineering there to have a reason for your satellite. Um, so we have three and, and kind of one more as well, a technology demo. So we have our gamma ray module, GMOD. We have our MBIO module, EMOD. We have wave-based control, WBC. And what does your satellite make of? Well, you want to make your satellite, but you don't want to be crazy about it, right? So you buy some stuff off the shelf, your commercial off the shelf. You don't make your own batteries. You don't make your own solar panels. You can if you want, but you'll spend years making your own batteries. So you try the bits that you can buy uh, and are reliable, you buy them, and then everything else you make yourself. Um, so a lot of CubeSat teams, especially university, would have one payload. We have three. Uh, so we were quite ambitious uh, in, in, in our uh, goals. Um, so looking in, this is, uh, again, the render of uh, AirSat uh, without its solar panels on. Also, this is scale, this is scale model. That's, that's exactly how big the satellite is. So people generally think it's smaller than they might have imagined a satellite is, but there's a lot packed in. So what's packed in? Um, we have all these things. You've got computer, you have an onboard computer, which is doing your, you know, it's running an operating system. It's making decisions about how the satellite's running. You have batteries, which are keeping the charge and keeping everything's going. Those batteries are charged by the solar panels, which will be on the outside. You have things that control this uh, power system. Uh, you have communication, so you can talk back to earth and also can receive signals from earth up to the satellite to tell it to do something like send us data or if we can update the software. Um, and then we have our experiments and we'll go into detail, but that cube uh, up at the top here is our GMOD experiment. The checkers at the top is our EMOD experiment. The wave control, wave based control when it's software. So we don't worry too much, uh, it doesn't have a, a mass. Um, and at the bottom, we have something called our antenna deployment module. And that's that fourth thing I was saying, our technology demo. Um, it's our antennas that fly out 
or hopefully don't fly out at all, but they, they spring out and allow us to communicate with the satellite. Uh, so it's a deployable mechanism. Uh, to talk about science, this is the thing, well, why, what does this satellite do? Well, one thing it does is detect gamma ray bursts. So gamma rays are very energetic events that happen in the universe. So when you have something like uh, a new star, a neutron star being bursted into the universe or black holes colliding, you have this massive energy that comes out, comes across the universe uh, to our satellite. But it's not, it's light, but it's not invisible light. It's in gamma ray frequency. Uh, so they're very bright for a very short amount of time. And our experiment, uh, GMOD, is picking up these and, and, and telling us uh, when they happen and the intensity. Uh, so here's some real hardware. I've been showing renders uh, somewhere about in the top Third, uh, there's this aluminium box, and inside that box is a scintillator. Uh, so scintillator is something that takes in gamma rays, the gamma rays that come from these bursts all across the universe into the box. Scintillator turns that into visible light, and then we have uh, sensors underneath that take that visible light and turn that into uh, electricity, something that we can count and, and make uh, uh, measurements with. Um, so uh, that, that's their one experiment. You see the guys looking at it on a, on a shaker there. Um, that's completely designed. It's been designed in the School of Physics uh, over multiple years before, and it's building on the basic research that would have been done there. Starts off as a computer model, designed the PCB, the electronics board, designed the casing, designed design all the electronics, and then try to characterize that and see how well it's going to perform. So you see this thing, always oh, everything that we've done and put in the satellite, it's been analyzed, nothing's thrown together, it's been a lot of work in someone's PhD or multiple pe people's PhDs. Um, this is the real satellite again. Um, this is the top. I just want to show EMOD. This is the, the black and white uh, squares. So uh, they're thermal coatings, basically. So they're um, made by Irish company MBio, and they're really good at, at protecting satellites from getting too warm, generally. So they're already on Solar Orbiter, which is a spacecraft by ESA and NASA. That's on its way, probably there now, uh, towards the sun. Uh, and the, uh, it's made by an Irish company. So the, the sunscreen, the thing that's closest to the sun on this satellite is made in, in uh, Ireland. Uh, we have it on our uh, satellite to see how it's going to perform in low Earth orbit, which is where we're going uh, over a long period of time. And you can see it's kind of isolated from the satellite in this, this, this reflective material, uh, shiny material there, which is called MLI, multi-layer insulation. It's kind of like the stuff that you, if you finish your marathon, they wrap you up with. So it's trying to isolate uh, the temperature there. Um, the last thing is, is uh, wave-based control or the last uh, payload. So when we get released, and this has been released from the CubeSat coming out of the International Space Station, we're going to get released from a rocket. The same kind of thing, it gets plopped out. It's like squeezing a, a tube of toothpaste or, a, or like a jack-in-the-box. It just kind of comes out and you're now in space. Um, and the first thing you do is when you come out, you might start tumbling, that you're twisting around one axis and you want to detumble so you can start communications. Uh, so how do you do that? <clears throat> so you need some sort of way to move your satellite around. And we don't have any propellant or thrusters or anything like that. Um, what we do have is magnet torques. Uh, so within our solar panels, which is the solar panel you see at the top there, there's also coils or there, there's uh, traces of, of, of copper basically that go around. If you have a coil and you put electricity through it, a current or voltage, uh, then you will turn it into a magnet. So you have an electromagnet. Our satellite is a magnet that we can control which faces of it, and there's one inside as well, which, which direction this magnetic field is going to be. And luckily, there's another magnet up there as well, which is the Earth. <clears throat> so we can do that. If we know what we're doing, if we can sense the Earth's magnetic field, we know where we are and where we're pointing, we can repel and attract ourselves to this Earth's magnetic field to let us point in the right direction uh, that we do. So there's a little box in between that, the sensor bit, where we have sun sensors, um, magnetometers, gyros. They tell us which way we're facing. The same kind of devices, not the sun sensor, but the things that are in your phone that when you flip your screen, your whole phone screen flips the right way. It knows which way that the phone is facing. Very similar on our satellite. We know our, which way our satellite's facing. What do you do with that information to tell these magnet torques to turn on and off? And that's our control algorithm, uh, which we call wave-based control. Um, so that was developed here in UCD. Uh, again, part of my PhD uh, under Willie and Joe, who's gonna talk as well, also worked on this. Uh, but the idea of controlling flexible systems how do you move something that's long and flexible? Like the one on the left, you try to move it fast, it'll shake, and those vibrations will go on for a very long time. But if you do it with uh, some sort of sensor feedback, so you know, go, you can move the same system, where it's very flexible, but have it stop dead and do your measurements. So we're implementing stuff like that, but this will be the first time in space. Here's some of the kind of early things. We want to test these control systems 
on Earth where there's gravity and friction and all this kind of stuff. So we set up systems like this. This is an air bearing, spherical air bearing. And we have a kind of, it's not a proper CubeSat, but a CubeSat system is a fun your project, which has reaction wheels in it and spin it around. And this way we can kind of set, have setups that mimic what's going to be up in Earth. Joe's going to show the AirSat ones, which are a bit more uh, complicated than uh, this. Uh, here's another satellite kind of analog that we have, again, with these flexible solar panels uh, sitting on an air bearing as well, where we try to uh, have sensors on it and do our, our control. I must clean the lab. Um, just the last bit here is the uh, technology demo at, at the end of, of our satellite. I thought it was antenna deployment module. So we have these antennas that come out so we can communicate, but because of the CubeSat standard, we can't go up with there. They have to be 10 by 10 by 10, 10, by 10 centimeters uh, at the bottom. Um, so we coil them up. You can see them kind of sprung, kind of like a tape measure inside. And then they're closed in by the doors. Uh, and if you're eagle-eyed among you, you will see that there's a little wire here that goes over these resistors, which keeps the door closed. But after we get pushed out of the rocket, 45 minutes after that, we'll put a command into those resistors to heat up, which will melt the lines and the doors will all spring open. Okay, so that's our deployment mechanism. Um, so we've built that from scratch here in UCD as well. Uh, and that moves in space is always difficult. Uh, I think Joe will talk a little bit about testing it as well. Um, here's a slow uh, kind of high-speed uh, video of it deploying. So you can see that the, the wire is snapped here. It's still springing back and forth. And it only furls. Uh, and when it's in space, we won't have gravity and it'll go straight. And hopefully that will allow us to communicate uh, with the satellite. And there's redundancy in there. There's multiple resistors and multiple ways we can burn it because it's very important that it, that it works. Um, we've had to build a lot of infrastructure. I think about six years ago when we started this, we just didn't really have anything. We had a blank page and, and then the idea for a satellite and then we had to actually go design uh, write down what we we're going to build, but then we actually had to build it. Um, so this is a room in, in the basement of the engineering. Uh, so it was kind of like a fridge that was used for injection molding. Uh, and we moved into it about uh, two years ago when we started doing testing. And now it looks like this. We've built up some uh, facilities. And I'm not going to talk about it because Joe is going to talk about them. But it's been a lot of building that's now put us in good state uh, to, to uh, keep uh, working uh, on these projects. Uh, how do we talk to the satellite? So this, we just said that the satellite has antennas that it puts out that allows it to do its uh, talking. We have to have something on Earth uh, so to communicate with it. So this is our antenna. It's on the roof of physics at the moment, but it's likely to move uh, soon as physics moves. Um, and as the satellite comes over the horizon, it's on motorized in two axes, so it can track uh, the satellite. And so every time the satellite comes over, we get about uh, well, seven, eight minutes of data coming back down again. Uh, and that's enough. So we have built all that ground station and all the where all the data goes uh, also here in UCD. Um, so launch, we kind of talked about launch. So the idea is that we would have launched on the 9th of March uh, of this year, but uh, late December of last year, the previous rocket, the one we were going to go on, had a problem and it blew up. Um, so they had to find out what's going on. Uh, so at the moment, we have a satellite that's finished that's sitting in our clean room and we're waiting for our, our bus to space. Um, when we do, we go to go from French Guiana. So it's a, to the sides near the equator, uh, down here is the European spaceport where that Ariane 5 rocket I showed to start and the Vega rocket, which we're going to be on uh, launch from. Uh, so we're excited uh, about that. Where we're going in space, we're going up 500, between 500 and 600 kilometers uh, around that, which we're going to be in that orbit. We're going to go 500, 600 kilometers up, but we're going to be going very fast sideways so we don't come back down again. Um, but just the idea, I try to show this sometimes, if we left Dublin and you went 500 or 600 kilometers, you hit about London, which isn't that far. Um, there's an idea that space is up there, but we think that's maybe really far away. But if I told you I was going to London, you wouldn't be too impressed, but you're more impressed if I say airsat going up into space. Uh, so space is closer than you think is, is, is I guess, the point there. Um, so this is the rocket. We, we'll go on our type of rocket. Um, take a seat. Um, and it goes off, it's got just this is just videos of rockets going up. But um, powerful things, maybe the fuel, but the payloads. We're not the main payload on this. So someone else paid most of the money to go up, and then we kind of ride share, which is how CubeSats work. The extra space on the rockets we fit in there uh, and, and then work. So it's 
something like 2,200 kilonewtons of trust, uh, which is about, um, what is that? About 200,000 guinea pigs, if you were to lift them up. That's how much trust that you would require uh, for that. Um, so when we're there, just multiple ways of going around the earth, uh, doing this little donut uh, about the earth here. Uh, and ours is, is something like this one. Uh, we're going over the poles, basically. Okay, so we're in the sun synchronous orbit that we go around. You could be going around the equator, you could be going at an any angle, uh, and it depends on where the rocket lets you out. Uh, and, and that's good. So uh, we're sun synchronous, so we're kind of, uh, what that means is that when we, we kind of, I guess we pass the equator at the same time, the same local time, every time we go around. Um, and that allows, allows us to kind of control the thermal environment that uh, we're uh, in all the time. So that's, that's kind of the way we're going to go around. Uh, that's the box it goes into. Um, so I said, just jack in the box before it goes out. We're doing a, a fit check there. Um, so the goes into the box. The box was going to go to Czech Republic. And then from the Czech Republic, that box goes to French Guiana onto the rocket. And then from that box, it goes straight out into space. Um, so I think I'm nearly done. I'm not sure how long I've done. I'm sure I've done 20 minutes. This is the kind of thing we can talk forever on. So uh, I'm going to wrap up soon. But it's the end of the satellite. Uh, it's the intended deployment. And what we have a poem that was written by a junior search uh, desk school kids uh, that we went out during COVID and uh, with the uh, Museum of Literature Ireland and working with the English department uh, here. And uh, they wrote poems based on their uh, kind of I guess, uh, feelings and understanding of their place in, in, in space. So it's called Always Home. Then the poem was curated into, all their poems was kind of created into one poem, uh, which was then laser etched and designed by Ima Raboyev, the artist in residence uh, over in science. Uh, so we have that. And we have on the other side of that, loads of names of, of the people that have helped us. And a lot of people have helped us uh, along the way. Um, I'm going to finish with, oh, I won't. Here we go. I'm going to finish with uh, this which is just a time lapse of an assembly of, of, a, of the, the spacecraft. Um, so you can see what's inside, how it's put together. Uh, you'll see, there was Joe there, he's coming later, but um, we don't assemble it too many times or disassemble it too many times. Uh, it's really, you, you put it together. In the background, you'll see all the paperwork. So we do more paperwork than we do building satellites. Um, and here you see, it's, it's like your Lego manual for each step getting ticked off, this is your quality assurance. Uh, side of things. So every time something gets put on, the node is made of how it's done and did it work that way? Is there some sort of error? Is there something that can't be done? Uh, and then if something goes wrong, you have some sort of paper record of, of, of it going on. Uh, you see me in the background there, nothing you can worry. Um, so uh, it's great. This is the clean room in, in physics, um, sort of the one in engineering, where you see all the uh, protective the straps for uh, static electricity, beard guards, the hair guards, and stuff. Because you have to have it going up in, in a clean way. So that's, there's so much stuff I could talk about. So, but I want to give 20 minutes and give the other guys some time. Um, so we'll be happy to take any questions right at the end, but uh, not much more happens after this. So we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Uh, and uh, oh, go back to that. Yes. So I'll invite Joe up. So as we said, Joe Thompson is our chief engineer. He's uh, in my group in mechanical and materials engineering. Uh, and he's going to talk about uh, testing of the satellite. So that's one thing that we do is, is a whole lot of testing. That's you, Joe. Uh, and uh, thanks very much. Yeah, so um, I'm Joe, uh, chief engineer on AirSat. So I suppose David showing you there the assembly of the satellite. Um, so once we assemble and had a flight model, I'm kind of going to describe what we did to test that then to make sure it's going to work when it gets to orbit. Um, so for a start, so how to test your satellite. So for a start, we, we divide tests for a spacecraft basically into two uh, main categories. We have ambient testing. So that's tests we can do in the lab here in ambient conditions. And that's the full functional test and the mission test. The full functional test is, as you'd expect, you're just checking that all the parts of the satellite function correctly. The mission test is a bit more involved and you're actually simulating a real mission with operators. Uh, Maeve is gonna talk about that a bit later, so I won't go into too much detail. The second category then is environmental testing. And that's where you're trying to submit the spacecraft to the different environments it's going to experience during the mission. 
there's two main ones there. You have vibration testing, which is when it gets launched in the rocket, it's going to experience vibration. Um, and then the second one is thermal vacuum. So when it's released in orbit, it's going to experience the vacuum of space. And it's also going to continually get um, heated up and cooled down as it goes around the Earth and comes into eclipse and out of eclipse. Um, so we follow this philosophy, which is test as you fly. So that's, we try to, um, as much as possible, uh, test things in the most representative way uh, we can that simulates what happens in the mission. So an example of that is that's why we do vibration first and then we do thermal vacuum. So we do vibration first because that's what happens during the launch. So the satellite switched off. Uh, we simulate this vibration. Then after the vibration test, we go to the thermal vacuum chamber because that's what happens then after it's released in orbit. So it gets, goes into vacuum, gets heated up and cooled down. Um, and that's important because if something happens during vibration, you get a little crack in a part or some damage. When you then thermally stress it and heat it up and cool it down, you can grow that crack or maybe cause some damage. And that's where the failure will become apparent. So it's important to try and simulate the mission as closely as possible. Um, so with AirSat, we have this thing called a prototype model philosophy. So you might say, what, what does model philosophy mean? Well, that's uh, how many physical models of the spacecraft you're going to build. And we decided to build two. So we have an engineering qualification model and we have a flight model. And the idea there is because we're doing things for the first time and we're learning a lot as we go through this whole process, uh, we didn't want to just put everything into one, uh, all our, uh, like, just build one. So we, we have an engineering qualification model. So we build a full satellite that's representative of the one we'll launch, and we do qualification level tests. So they're really stringent tests, and that proves that the satellite's going to survive the different uh, things we put it through. Then when we're happy that the design is good, that it's qualified, then we build an identical second copy. So the flight model, that's the one we're going to launch. And then we don't have to do as extreme tests on that satellite. So we do acceptance level tests. So, um, and that's just to show that, okay, we've built this. It's as good as the qualification model. And now it's, it's ready for launch. Um, so it'd be easy to think now when we talk about testing that first you do all the building and then you test the satellite. But in reality, as anyone who's built anything before will know, the testing starts right at the beginning. So we've been testing for five years. So and that testing starts with the subsystems, the boards themselves, the parts we've built in UCD. So particularly ADM, the ADM, EMOD and GMOD. So there was a, there's a, a qualification model and a flight model of the satellite. But for those, for ADM, EMOD, and GMOD, there's been loads of models and development models and prototypes and tests where things go wrong, things break, you go back, redesign. Um, so it's important to, to realize that, I suppose, that the testing starts at subsystem level. And you can see here, something we use for that is a, a flat set. So that's all the boards, rather than being stacked up like they are in the full satellite, uh, like you see here, so they're, they're laid out flat on a desk and connected together. So we can verify that all the, uh, they all communicate properly and work before we, before we build up the satellite. And here on this, you can see a mixture of that, some of our qualification models of the, the off the shelf parts and different development models of the, the payloads. So we've been testing that all along before. So before we ever built a spacecraft, uh, a lot of testing has happened, I suppose. And then with those individual units, the ADM, EMOD, and GMOD, they are all also did the environmental testing. So they all got a vibration test and a thermal vacuum test uh, before we ever tried to build uh, a full spacecraft. So that testing at subsystem level, here's an example of some of that. So top left, that's a long range test of our antenna. So we went up the Dublin mountains and we're communicating from about 10 kilometers away. Uh, with the ground station in UCD. On the top right, we actually characterized our antenna in the Hertz anechoic chamber, which is in STEC in the Netherlands, um, which is a massive uh, anechoic chamber used for big spacecraft being built by uh, European Space Agency. I'm pretty sure it's the smallest test item that's ever been in the Hertz chamber, <laughs> as you can see. Um, Bottom left, that's a thermal vacuum test of an early prototype of our antenna. Uh, and bottom right is the, the gamma ray detector GMOD. Uh, so as you can see, it looks pretty scary the first time. Of a 
uh, of vibration. Um, so a bit more uh, in a bit more detail now, the tests we do on the full satellite. So the ambient testing, full functional test is first. That's basically we test all the functions of the different parts of the satellite. That was actually broken down into 44 different test procedures we do, which takes two to three weeks. So it's a very involved, long process testing every single function on the satellite. So all the subsystems, um, the thousands of different parameters we can get from all the different boards. Um, and we have to do that twice. So we do it first, we did it here in UCD um, during the summer. Then we went, did the environmental test. So you do the vibration, the TVAC, and then you do it again after you come back because you want to see, right, has anything changed during those environmental tests? Um, has anything been damaged here? Did the performance change? <clears throat> um, and this is a little video of one of our most important functional tests. So the first thing that has to happen after the release in orbit, which is the antenna deployment. That's what we hope will happen about 45 minutes after we're released from, from the rocket. Um, and that's actually our secondary mechanism. So we have, we have two methods to release the antenna. Uh, we have primary resistors and they release them uh, one at a time. And then this is actually the backup resistor, so which, which just open everything at once. So that's our testing, our redundancy. Um, one of the more interesting system level tests then, and something I've worked a lot on and David showed the lab we've built in engineering is our ADCS testing setup. So ADCS is attitude determination and control system. So attitude determination is figuring out what way you're pointing in space, and then control is using some actuators to move your spacecraft and point in the direction you want. So basically what this test rig does is we have we have three main sensors for attitude determination. We have magnetometers, which sense the Earth's magnetic field, and we want to create signals for those sensors, and we use for that, we use something called a Helmholtz cage. So that's the kind of cage you can see around the spacecraft. And what it is, is it's three pairs of coils uh, of copper wire. We pass a current through them. We can generate whatever magnetic field we want in the center of where the spacecraft is. That's for your magnetometers. We also have sun sensors on every face of the satellite so to detect the angle to the sun. Um, and for that, we have a sun simulator, which is a xenon lamp, basically. Um, and then lastly, we have a, a turntable so we can control the angular position and velocity of the satellite. And that is picked up then by the onboard gyroscopes. So this rig is basically designed to, uh, to excite those three different sensors and show that our attitude determination and control uh, works. And you can see that's our flight model getting tested in the middle of the cage there. So this is a little time lapse of what a, a sun sensor test looks like. So we're rotating the, the satellite to different angles and then checking that we get uh, the right values from our sensors. Okay, so on to the environmental testing then, the vibration and the TVAC. So like I said, with the other testing, this started at the subsystem level. So we didn't just do the first test with our flight model. Um, we've been very lucky to have access to this lab in Belgium called the CubeSat Support Facility which is especially for the flyer satellite program. And we've been there a lot over the last five years. So the first time in December, 2018 with, with the first um, prototype of our antenna. And then we were there with all the different payloads. So with EMOD, uh, the ADM and GMOD, and we did vibration and thermal vacuum with all those. In 2021, we built our qualification model of the satellite. And then in October, we went, we did the vibration and thermal vacuum test. And then about 10 months later, we had built the flight model. So some minor changes, uh, got all the parts again, built another model of the satellite. And then it was last August that we did the vibration and thermal vacuum test with the flight model. And that's a nice selfie uh, from the satellite's point of view, what it looks like going into the thermal vacuum test. So, the two major um, environmental tests, first vibration, so just in a bit more detail. So it simulates the vibration experience during the launch, as we've said. For that test, the satellite is switched off, like it will be for the launch, um, and it's loaded in the deployer. So the box David talked about that it's gonna be on, on the rocket and the, 
basically comes out like a jack in the box. Um, so it's loaded into that and it's put on this shaker, which is in the middle picture, you can see, and then it gets shaken on all three axes. So you get sine vibration and random vibration are the two major tests we do. And you want to figure out, okay, is, is, is the satellite okay after we do this shaking? So the way you do that is you do something called a resonance search. So that's actually a really low level sine vibration test where you sweep through all the frequencies and with an accelerometer, you can see what the response of the satellite is. So you basically pick up its resonant frequencies. Then you do the vibration test. You do another resonance search afterwards and you can see if anything has changed. So that would be an indication of some damage or something moving around or something shifting. Um, and then as well, satellite switched off for the test, but beforehand, after we traveled to Belgium, we did a reduced functional test. So not the three weeks of testing, but uh, just the major functions of the satellite. So we do that before and after the vibration uh, to check that nothing has, has changed. The other major environmental test then is the TVAC test. Um, so again, simulates the vacuum and thermal environment in orbit. We had 22 temperature sensors installed on the satellite to see how it responded to the environment. Uh, you do four cycles. So you go hot, cold four times. For the first one, the satellite switched off. That's your non-operational cycle. So you can go to slightly higher and lower temperatures. Then you do three operational cycles. So that's what the satellite switched on. You go to hot, you stay there, you let all the components get to that temperature. And then you do some functional tests when you have the satellite hot. So that's one, one of the major objectives there is to do functional tests at the high and low temperatures. Another objective is to thermally uh, cycle all the mechanical components. So like I said, stress it thermally. So you can see, did anything happen during vibration and is, are the thermal stresses gonna make that worse? And then finally, you want to collect all that temperature data to correlate with your computer model. So basically you have a thermal model where you can simulate uh, both steady state heat transfer and what it's like in orbit. And you're collecting that temperature data to, to correlate to your model. Um, and when you correlate the test, then you can, you can simulate what's gonna happen in orbit and you see what temperature uh, your different components are at. Um, so that's me. I think I'm gonna hand over to Maeve now, who's gonna talk a bit about software and operations. Hi all. So um, yeah, I've heard a lot about the hardware of the spacecraft. I hope to provide some insight into software and operations. I recently finished my PhD um, with the School of Physics that was uh, focused on this. Sorry, that was uh, focused on my work with AirSat One. And I'm now on the team as flight software and operation scientists, where I am helping prepare the operations team for mission control of AirSat One on orbit, uh, but interfacing with the software I developed during my PhD. These buttons. Uh, yeah, so AirSat One's flight software can kind of be divided into three parts. So the first is what we could call platform software, and this is flight ready software that has been provided to us uh, with our commercial off-the-shelf components by Clydespace. So um, this is like firmware and software that run on the battery, the EPS, um, ADCS, and our transceiver um, components. Um, so they're ready for us to use, and we don't need to develop these in-house. We then have two other parts of the software, which we do have to develop in-house. The first has been our payload software. So this is software to run on MSP, Texas Instruments, MSP, uh, 430s on our GMOD and EMOD uh, motherboards. Um, and then the next software, which was more the focus of my PhD, is uh, the main flight software, which we had to develop in house to run on our main onboard computer or OBC. <coughs> oh. So, AirSat One's OBC is a commercial off the shelf component from AAC Clydespace. It incorporates a micro semi smart Fusion 2 system on chip and has an ARM Cortex M3 processor. We're dealing with um, four gigabytes of flash memory, eight megabytes of MRAM. Um, our main communication buses on board AirSat 1 that give the OBC the ability to communicate with our other subsystems on board are I2C interfaces. And then we also have serial interfaces for our payloads. 
The job of the software then that runs on this OBC is uh, interfacing with the spacecraft subsystems and controlling the behavior of the system as a whole. So bringing all those different hardware and software parts together um, to allow the mission to function during the different operational phases of the mission. So it's just to give you an idea of what these operational phases are and what flight operations actually looks like. So first we're deployed into orbit. AirSat-1 is off during this time, so the software doesn't have any role here. Um, the OBC is powered down, but when we're deployed into orbit, these uh, separations, which is a release that allow AirSat-1 to power on, and the software on the OBC, its main job first is the separation sequence. So what the separation sequence is responsible for doing is a 45 minute wait timer. Um, this is a requirement on us, um, at the end of the 45 minute wait timer, we deploy airsat ones um, dipole antenna elements and we start RF transmissions. It's a requirement on us because we have to make sure we're far enough away from the thing that deployed us and also anything else that came out with us that we don't deploy our antenna elements and hit anything, I suppose. Um, so this is what separation sequence must do. Um, once this happens, we can make uh, communication, two-way communication with airsat one what we call initial acquisition of signal or AOS. Uh, we hope to make this two-way communications uh, with the ground station that's currently situated on the roof of the School of Physics at UCD. Um, but AirSat-1 will start beaconing after these 45 minutes, so anyone from the amateur radio community worldwide might hear AirSat before we do and be able to report its status to us. So that would be very nice. Um, for it to come over uh, Ireland, though, in UCD, it could take hours. That's the initial phase of the mission. We then move on to post-launch health checks and commissioning. So this is where the software is in a pretty um, idler, stable state, but we command it to give us information and do these different functional checks almost on orbit to make sure all of our spacecraft subsystems are healthy following launch and are ready to start nominal operations. So nominal operations is hopefully years of us collecting data, um, running our experiments, running GMOD and EMOD, and uh, periodically going into this mode called WBC mode, where we run our um, software-based attitude control experiment. So that's hopefully what flight operations primarily looks like. But in addition to this, the role of this software and the role of our operators on the ground is also to deal with this uh, aspect of flight operations, which is off nominal operations. So space is extremely harsh environment to operate in first of all, but then once we launch it, we can't access the spacecraft in the way that we do on ground with normal computers. We need to make sure that it's robust to false, that the software can um, bring itself back autonomously into a safe state um, and allow us to command it to figure out what happened through um, RF communications and then command it back into a nominal um, state. So the flight software has been developed with the aid of a flight software development kit from a company called Bright Ascension. We chose to use a flight software development kit to deal with an initial lack of experience and expertise in the project in spacecraft development. It facilitates rapid software development in C for small and nano satellite missions. And how it does this is by component based development where they have provided us with a framework or suite of pre-validated components. Um, where they're standalone reusable components and you link components together with specific functionalities to provide the required functionality for your mission. Um, some components have been provided that have been specifically made for COTS hardware. So the kit has actually been provided with software components to interface with Clyde space hardware. Um, and many have flight heritage, which is a huge advantage for us when we're trying to reduce risk and make sure the mission works. Alternative development options are available, although this was seen as the best option for AirSat 1. Some other CubeSat teams use other um, development kits um, or resources out there, or also if it's not their first satellite, they might have um, in house developed um, software previously. But this was the development option AirSat 1 chose. During the development process, we incorporated a lot of open source and well-documented um, software development tools, such as the Clips development environment that was um, suited to plugins that were provided with our flight software development kit. We used Git and GitHub for version control, and then we implemented a number of tools to do continuous integration and testing. The components that we developed in-house um, were developed and incorporated into the main flight software image following a iterative and inter incremental development approach um, where we built up the image over time. 
but this development was very much aligned with our engineering and qualification model timeline with the idea that if we build the software for the EQM, it gets very well tested during the EQM's test campaign. And then when we come to our flight model, we're um, testing it again. So it's not the first time the software has been tested. So what this testing would look like, um, it was carried out throughout the development process, as Joe said, testing kind of starts on day one. So a lot of informal testing that has incorporated software-based unit level testing um, through to full hardware in the loop testing. So when the satellite hardware has available, I've had the lucky opportunity to um, interact with this uh, hardware on the uh, flatsat, which we call AirFlat1, or when it's integrated into its stack as AirSat1. In addition to these informal tests then that I've been conducting throughout the development process, um, there's also the formal system level tests. So this is the ambient test campaign and the environmental test campaign that Joe talked about. Although these are tests of the mission, the software and the hardware, but the software as well has to function reliably for us to be able to pass these tests. This gave us a lot of confidence in the software's performance. The first being the functional testing, which were carried out at ambient conditions here in UCD in our clean rooms in physics and engineering, and during and around environmental testing at the CubeSat support facility. So that's us in front of um, the TVAC chamber, well, that's me on the laptop screen anyway, in front of the TVAC chamber in the CubeSat support facility with AirSat inside, and then mission testing. So this was also a key part of my PhD, prepping this anyway. Mission testing is a mission simulation, about a month-long mission simulation, so a very long test where we're continuously conducting the test as if AirSat-1 has already launched and is in orbit. AirSat-1 was situated in the clean room in engineering here, and we pretended it was in orbit. No one was allowed into the clean room, no one was allowed to see into the clean room bar a handful of operators who were test operators, and then we had our mission control team based in physics remotely operating the satellite and um, carrying out a mission simulation. And then our lovely test support operators would inject faults into the test in the engineering clean room and our operators, our mission control team would have to handle it over in physics. So we've done that both on the EQM and FM models of AirSat-1 for month long testing. In addition to verifying the software and the hardware's performance, a key benefit of this test is that it has allowed us allowed us to um, get a very complete kind of data set, um, a baseline data set for what on orbit uh, data sets will look like when we downlink them um, on the ground during mission operations. Yeah, so that's all for me. I think I don't know if we have a closeout, but I know that we're all here for questions if anyone has any. One here. Okay, well, maybe start with um, this working. I think so. Hey, hi guys. First of all, wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was really, really interesting. Um, but I'm I'm not going to give you my comments just yet. What I'm going to do is I've got one question already in, which is from Jarrett Doyle, and he's saying environmental testing did not include radiation tests. Are the satellite electronics hardened against radiation? solar and cosmic uh yeah so i can i can try to answer that even though i'm not an expert on radiation testing i think in, in like a lot of the off-the-shelf components would have um slight heritage but in general i think cube sat components because of the philosophy is to build something cheap not spend the amount of money with developing um commercial space flight hardware is that a lot of them aren't uh, radiation hardened components, but if you pick the off the shelf components that show good hardness to radiation, I think that's that's the approach really. There was some radiation testing done on the GMOD payload, um, but I can't, I can't say anything else to say more about that. Wait, did you have software deficiencies? Um, yeah, so first of all, as Joe said, there was some um, radiation testing done on the GMOD components. In particular, we wanted to make sure that we were radiation tolerant against or not hardened, but against um, radiation damage over time. And there's detectors in GMOD called SIPMs, and they experience uh, radiation degradation over time. And we wanted to make sure that it's not uh, sort of little enough that the mission and the GMOD goals can still be achieved. Um, so that testing proved that GMOD could survive on orbit and continue to um, 
achieve its aims due to that radiation damage. Uh, in terms of software, I guess we could still experience things like pig flips and stuff from um, radiation events. Uh, the OBP has some radiation tolerance building, uh, error protection threat mechanisms um, to make sure that uh, big C writers of memory are correct and haven't experienced pig flips. But uh, the software is hopefully robust to remove some of the data. So. Any questions from here? Okay. We follow John. He steps in. Right, thank you for it. Yeah. First, fantastic presentation, guys. Really enjoyed it. Uh, most intriguing insight into a lot of very, very hard work being condensed down into three 20 minute slots. So, very impressive. I'm just curious. When is end of life or what defines end of life or how do you expect this all to end? Yeah, so I guess there's, there's two ways it can end. Uh, well, one is a definite way that it's going to come back down to Earth and it's going to burn up completely, right? So how, how we know that is we do orbital lifetime simulations. So we, we have mathematical simulations of, of how heavy this is, the size of it, and then it's going around Earth what's going to make it come back down again. Um, so even though we're up at 500, 600 kilometers, just tiny little bits of atmosphere that slow down air set. Uh, we get solar radiation pressure, so bits of the sun hitting off it and slowing us down. So when you slow down, you come down. So at about at 520 kilometers, it's about five years you come down. Higher than that, by 560, it's 13 years you come down. Um, so it'll come down. We don't have anything that make it go back up again or bring it down. So it's just Newton's laws were in his hands. Um, so it comes down that way. In terms of mission lifetime, will AirSat last 13 years? That's a very hard question to answer. Um, like you say, this is, you know, it has the, the guts of a, you know, a computer with batteries and laptop. And if you turn your laptop on now and then in 13 years time, come back to it, you think it's gonna be still on. That's why we have ways of resetting it and rebooting it and that kind of thing. But hardware, even on earth, will, Will not last. So the mission lifetime might be less than, than the time it actually stays up there. Um, for us, acquisition of signal and then working that we can meet, get scientific data coming down, do our, our experiments, uh, then that's that's a success. I mean, turning on and, and working is a success uh, as well. Um, but ideally, it stays up for as long as possible because this is the final year projects for engineering students and physics students for the future. The idea of not having to work on a table in the engineering building, but say, you can write some uh, control algorithm and your test bed is that satellite that's going around in space. That's a very powerful thing that we're going to have. And, and it being an educational satellite, uh, its longevity is important in that way. Uh, so hopefully it lasts a long time, but I want to stay up there forever. And the simulations, well, I said it burns up. That's another something that we do. Um, so we do, um, there, there's models provided by European Space Agency where you, you work out, you tell it the materials, you tell it the size, and it tells you if it's going to burn up or not, or how much is going to come back down again. And luckily for us, apart from we don't get to keep anything, luckily for us, nothing comes back down again. I have a question that comes on from that. Just how did you choose that orbital path? Was it, um, and then I hear at that level, it's quite busy in terms of other satellites. How, what's the probability of hitting another satellite? <laughs> Yeah, well, we're not the main customer on the rocket. So you go up and, and you, you kind of, we requested, so you do your analysis and you say, uh, we can survive in this thermal environment and we can survive for this long. And we want to be up there for a certain amount of time. And that says kind of what orbit you want to be in. So if you say that Vega rocket that's going up, the big nose cone bit at the top. And at the top of that is the satellite that's paid the most money, right? And, and that's paid, it, it, you know, it's a hundreds of millions type of satellite uh, and they want to go somewhere and they choose. Then you can get secondary uh, and tertiary burns, something like that. So they'll go, it'll put that side into orbit and it might burn again to put you into a different orbit if they're nice. Um, and that, so in the end, we get options of, of where to go. Say so you can go now uh, and pick this orbit or you can wait another year and there might be a better orbit for you and you've got to make a, a balance of that. But we don't call the shots uh, on, on that. Um, so it's good enough uh, for us. Uh, uh, so yeah, we're, we're happy. 
Yeah, so that's a that's a, I wish I, knew, I could tell you a very clear answer to it. Um, I said we were ready to go this January to to put it and, and send it off for launch in, in March. Uh, like I say, it's it's delayed. Isa hold the cards close to your chest uh, when it's coming out. Uh, but what we're told is that they're going to try to launch another Vega rocket uh, over the summer and then another one at the end of the year. So at the moment, that's what we're playing around with and, and we're trying to get, we want to launch as soon as possible because we're ready, uh, but we're just going to have to wait uh, until uh, we get our ticket. Um, but yeah, we're, 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 we've seen enough of it now, <laughs> six years. Uh, we're happy to have it there and we're, we're still poking it and doing some tests uh, to make sure uh, we have it, but uh, yeah, we're ready to go. Uh, do you intend to send a satellite to land on the moon or to land on Mars? <laughs> it's not in the pipeline at the moment. <laughs> um, from a CubeSat point of view, CubeSats have already traveled to Mars and to the moon. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. There's lots of ideas for future projects, more uh, bigger CubeSats with gamma ray detectors. Um, I'm sure Maeve or David up there in the audience would tell you more about. But, yeah. yeah, so as Joe was saying, there's CubeSats are also being used not just for, so AirSats uh, mission in itself, but CubeSats are being seen as ways to enable other things. So the two CubeSats, they went to Mars. Uh, there was two called Marco A and Marco B. And they went as communication relays, actually, to allow um, communications with a lander um, to Mars. So while they weren't the primary mission, they were being used to help the mission, to facilitate the mission, because they were seen as these um, cheap kind of spacecraft that could serve a really useful, useful need. And just a supplementary, do, do you intend to put any living animal or uh, in the satellite to see how... Um, a living, uh, yeah, uh, probably something. not. Uh, <laughs> I, the idea of the ethics application for that uh, would, would put me off. Um, so obviously, we, I mean, we have a orbiting space station for the last 23 years that's going around and, and has had well, plant life and, and six astronauts living on it most of the time, mm -hmm. uh, telling us uh, what's going on. We have a lot of data uh, uh, about it. Some early launches would have started off with things like monkeys and all uh, animals uh, that, but now what's more important is, is how humans live in space um, uh, and things like the space station are getting us ready for, well, first the moon and then, and then, and then to Mars. So the data has been, it, there's a lot of work in, in biological uh, stuff there, but uh, it doesn't really fit CubeSats. Uh, a little bit more about going to the moon or whatever. You you want to start with a with a scientific question or an engineering technology you want to um, develop, and then your mission gets built on top of that. So you know, I don't see us going to the moon for the sake of going to the moon. But if there's a question to be answered, well, that's when you start building your satellite around that. It's not a, really about the exploration that way. So yeah, um, yeah, it will be fun though. Right? Okay. Thank you very much. If uh, if uh, the next rocket didn't make it, um, would you go through the process of building the exact same satellite or would you try for something bigger? Like the 12 view, I think it was. Yeah, well... I suppose the, the first thing you think of is, oh, we do have a copy, which is the engineering model. So one thing you could possibly do is use some parts there. I mean, it doesn't have all the same parts as the flight model. For instance, our qualification model has solar panels that just have little aluminium panels instead of real solar cells so that they're just representative of the proper mass. So we'd have to buy some new components, but we do have uh, an engineering model which we could probably reuse a lot of components from if we wanted to rebuild AirSat. Um, of course, we'd love to build bigger satellites as well, but you have to find the funding to do that. And that's something a lot of people are working on in the background as well. Or you could make smaller satellites because why, why necessarily make a bigger one? That's why everyone wants to seem to go with. You can, you can do useful science on an even smaller platform than a one you um, 
few so, so yeah lots of ideas for future projects so. So we do uh, we have yeah as that stops we, we have more projects coming on uh so uh myself and Gina McGreen physics have a six you uh in in the in the thing so three times bigger than airsat which which has six detectors six kind of gmod type things and that's the idea but again as joe says bigger isn't always better it's only if you want you have stuff to fill the space um if you can fit your your the answer to your question into a smaller thing you're, you're looking at a, at a cheaper launch and a, and a, maybe you can build multiple of them have a constellation or and that's better you build in your redundancy that way by uh like starling can always be you, you you launch 10 of them and six of them work and that's great and instead of putting all your eggs in one basket um yeah so it's not a natural thing to go oh, we're going to build a 2u and then a 6u and then we're going to have you know something the size of this room or whatever you know it, it, it's uh it's not really about size any anymore yeah well the, there's multiple things but one the ability to we're, we're setting up that we have the ability to design or launch our own payloads that are specific to ireland so if we have a problem or an issue around like forestry or peace or something so something that we want to know about we, we have the ability that irish companies can solve the problems that they have locally um economically space is just a, a massively growing industry um that has kind of changed from the world of having to be you know america or russia or china but you have a lot of small countries building up their space sectors um with, with great success um so I talked a little bit about the European Space Agency that we put in money and it comes back to us, uh, that's just kind of geo return. But it, what happens when it comes back to the contracts uh, in Irish companies, they go and it's generally a multiplier of about four to six on that. So we're, we're building stuff in Ireland and then exporting it and bringing in four times, six times the money back into our economy. Um, and the space economy is going to be in 2040, about one trillion euro it's kind of equivalent to tourism kind of thing so we either now decide that we want to educate our students and build have the people who are going to build companies when the time is, is, is right now or we don't and we missed a boat um so there's uh there's a yeah there's a good time now for ireland to invest in it it can seem like that's a funny thing to be putting money into space when you could be putting it into housing or something like that. But it's 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 the long term economic gain for the country that allows us to put money into education and, and space. So um, and we need the people in in the university. Our space companies are doing great stuff outside, but the space companies to grow need great students uh, that that are that are coming out of, of places like UCD. So the more we do here at the lower level stuff is going to feed in to and build up our economy. Just Hello. Um, to what extent did you work with like suppliers and other companies within Ireland on the build? Yeah, so we had just multiple parts of the satellite that are coming. So we have uh, our GPS antenna, uh, that's on, there's no model, a GPS antenna on the side comes from Tau class. The experiment, the black and white uh, coupons at, at the top, they're MBio, another Irish company. Um, we have Real Trust Space, uh, do our, produce our PCBs. Uh, so they're a space company that built the cameras on the James Webb telescope or, or, or that, that we saw the James Webb, James Webb telescope uh, disappearing. Um, we have, uh, we've had a lot of support from just Irish companies around manufacturing and, and uh, building parts uh, of the satellite. Uh, the uh, sensor for the GMOD, the uh, photo multipliers? No? Yes, SPMs, yeah. Yeah, Sensor, which is a company, uh, it's been bought now, but it's down in Cork. So there's already Irish industrial payloads scattered uh, along the uh, the satellite. And that's kind of, we see we have that and, and more coming in the pipeline of, of working with industry uh, when that, so we're, we're kind of meeting the industry needs that they have questions they want to answer, but they don't have the experience in building satellites or they don't want to go through five, six years uh, to get there. So uh, the other follow on project that we have already in space is around that the idea of, of speeding up development of, of CubeSats. Uh, so around modeling them in, in called, uh, 
what are they systems engineering? So how do you software describe the whole satellite so you can answer the questions quickly without building it? Uh, so if you want a satellite, uh, how do you quickly know which type of satellite you want to build? Um, and do you might have heard, of, I think, of digital twinning, where you have your physical satellite, but you also have your software satellite, uh, and you can do tests with that. Uh, so we have ongoing work uh, going in that. Um, but coming, uh, ho hopefully, at the end of the year, also, yeah, a, a good few more Irish industry uh, uh, working with us on, on, on future satellites. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so this is a question from Alistair Langwell, okay, and he says, I appreciate that launch is being arranged with the ESA, but would there be plans or would it even make economic sense to use private launch companies in the future, e.g. Blue Origins? Uh, yeah, certainly. Obviously, in this because of the program we're on, we're and the launch has been provided by ESA this time. We're we're locked into going on a European rocket. Um, but yeah, certainly we'd be open to all di the different launch opportunities uh, with private space companies, SpaceX launching an awful lot of CubeSats. Um, yeah. You can know it's it's a good point, uh, and if you have the ability to use multiple launch providers, then I think answer to a question one of the early ones about orbit and what you can pick that widens your choice of orbit. So the European launchers are launching well at the moment twice a year, but maybe four, four or six times a year. If if SpaceX is going or Rocket Lab is going to different orbits, then you you have more choice about what's what's going on. Um, and certainly, if you're paying for the launch, then you're you're trying to get the best price. Um, so it's, it's usually this price between reliability. If the rocket hasn't gone too much or has had failures, you might get it for cheaper. But European rockets have, have generally been uh, quite uh, reliable. Just a question then <clears throat> on the manufacturing of the CubeSats. You said it took about five years to get to where you are now. Did you, during that process, work out better ways of manufacturing? Would you intend to get it down to? You know, the testing in particular was something that really struck a chord as far as how long it took. Is that something that could be streamlined going forward? Yeah, so I suppose for us, um, we say there's that one to five years to build or develop, but um, a lot of that time was learning, um, was us figuring it out, uh, developing the subsystems at unit level, testing them, finding out something wasn't necessarily robust to the vibration campaign, redesigning, retesting. So the time lapses that we showed of the actual build airsat is built in two three days the actual build process is quite short um so if you are building multiple spacecraft or more spacecraft down the line that are similar to the one that you've already built the next ones that come along will be much quicker and uh yeah they can be developed in a much shorter time frame now if you change the design a lot obviously you have to go through some of that development and test process again but i do think a lot of um airsat's timeline has been down to students gaining knowledge um taking the time to kind of tackle the learning curve that is ireland's first satellite and hopefully yeah hopefully now we can bring that forward into the next missions um, yeah, I, I, I'd say the same thing uh, i think it took five years because we're doing it for the first time and learning an awful lot um i think it what david said about our ongoing projects model-based systems engineering these are they came about because we're thinking about right how can you develop these faster um, how can you model them better uh, on with computer simulations and do the analysis and quickly update the analysis and check if i want to change this parameter here can i do that i think the problem with a satellite a complex system like that is it's very hard to to test it until you have the full thing built and that's where you run into a lot of problems so managing that whole systems engineering and being able to automate as much as possible and automate your analyses, that's kind of what we're working on now at the moment, and that'll make the development a, a lot faster, as well as all we've learned over the last five years. Sorry, I should also point out in those five years, we have built two airsats. So we always talk about building airsat, but the engineering qualification model was built and test in full, and then the FM was built and test in full. So we have gone through two full spacecraft at this stage. 
<laughs> yeah, just, um, I think it's a massive feather in the cap of UCD that the AirSat project, you know, I just, I know David was saying that he was disappointed that the rocket didn't go off in March. I just was thinking in my head, is there any space race on in, in Ireland with another university that we don't know about or... No, I don't think so. And, and I guess with the, um, this is a secret university, but the, the, we're not too worried because we know how long it takes. <laughs> so uh, it, it, one's not going to pop up uh, uh, that quick. But, you know, it, it'd be great to see the more space that's happening in Ireland, the better in general. Um, so uh, yeah, hopefully people will, will, will see it, uh, the project and, and the success. And, and, and even, I said, if it never turns on, it's a success in terms of the educational value. Um, uh, that we've gotten but uh no we haven't in that wales were trying to launch their first satellite there and it blew up on the on the way up so but uh every, every other eu country has has launched a satellite uh so we're, we're we're definitely overdue um for our one but uh no we're building a lot and, and i and susan started as as we have c space the center for space research in ucd which which goes broader than the cubesat uh uh, things so material science, astrophysics, ground-based astronomy. Um, so there's a there's a hub of, of stuff happening. AirSat's the most visible thing, but uh, in UCD, it, it, there's a lot uh, of white space. There was one more question, which was from Leo Enright. He wanted to know, was this being recorded and would, would he get it later? <laughs> and uh, so I just typed an answer back to him saying that, yes, he would. Uh, um, and uh, what we normally do with these kind of events is we will send a link to everyone who was registered when we have the recording ready. It's not as high tech as what the guys have been working on, but we still fingers crossed that the recording has actually worked properly. But if it has, we will make sure everyone gets a link to it and we'll put it up on our website as well. So it falls to me to say a really big thank you to the three representatives of a very large team. Um, what I'd like to actually say is um, one thing David said, he said, space is closer than you think. And he was talking about it in the physical environment. What I've learned tonight is that the work of UCD and a huge number of people in UCD has brought space closer for Ireland. Um, it has started us, maybe overdue, but it has started us on that road to being a part of a huge future for the planet, uh, something that we weren't uh, at the races in before. Um, I'm hugely impressed that two uh, space vehicles have been uh, created here. Um, and uh, I, I am totally overawed by the amount of learning that's gone into that and just the vision to be willing to get going because quite often people would say, the others are so far ahead, is there any point in joining this race? So um, I'd say really big well done. Thank you so much for your time and um, thank you for the, the vision, the innovation, the collaboration. Uh, and I love to see that so many different parts of the university have been involved. Um, I'm going to invite the people who are here present to join us for a chat with the guys. And, and hopefully I think there might be some teas and coffees outside afterwards. So do stay. And the questions you didn't want to ask with the throw around mic, you might get to ask afterwards. Um, and look, we will be having uh, more events, maybe not quite as futuristic as this one. But um, do stay tuned and look in. And just one final uh, thing is thank you uh, to Claire and the rest of the team for helping organize the event. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in and arrived in person. Um, and um, should we say safe traveling? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay.